he did not want Russia to get his DNA. So this, there's a lot in there for us to unpack and a lot in there for us, right, to understand. French President Macron um, did not take the PCR test over fears that the Russians would get hold of his DNA. Now, if Macron did not take the test because he no one Russia to get him DNA, then can you imagine what has happened to all of us DNA who have taken the PCR? You know, uh, Professor Ka- Professor uh, Rosalie Hamilton is writing in today's uh, Gleaner, uh, the bank fees legislative football game. Uh, you can check that out. She says at a time when the nation is reeling under the oppressive fallout of the COVID pandemic, the bank's imposition of higher bank fees and charges has evoked a visceral reaction. Uh, from many, even Prime Minister Holness and Finance Minister Nigel Clark have joined the public outrage and have denounced the increased fees. They joined PM Mayor Motley and other leaders across the world who are pressuring the financial sector to reduce or eliminating predatory fees and charges. And I know I pronounce the visceral wrong. But here's the situation. Um, the Prime Minister and the Finance Minister coming out and talking against the fees is smoke and mirrors. We're going to go to but read, read um, Professor Hamilton's article, a um, very interesting article in the papers this morning, The Gleaner. We're going to go to the phone lines. Uh, my very special guest in this segment of the program is Dr. Maziki Thame, Senior Lecturer in the Institute of Gender and Development Studies. Her research focuses on the post-colonial Caribbean, the place of race, class, violence, radicalism, identity, and gender in political life. Uh, Her work asks questions about how gender, race, and class shape experiences of citizenship and how liberation is pursued in the Caribbean, in the modern Caribbean. Her most recent publications include Woman Out of Place, Portia Simpson Miller, uh, uh, as well as Middle Class Politics in Jamaica. That's Middle Class Politics in Jamaica. Black Women in Politics, Demanding Citizenship, Challenging Power and Seeking Justice. And Alexander Floyd and... Uh, no, no, no. Alexander Floyd would be one of the editors. And Racial Hierarchy and the Elevation of Brownness in Creole Nationalism. That's published in Small Acts 54. We go to the phone lines now to speak with my very special guest, Dr. Maziki Thame, on Jamaica and the Neoliberal Agenda. Dr. Thame, thank you so much for joining us. Welcome to the program. Morning, Kabu, and thank you for inviting me you know i have to bring you up because you are keeping your fire blazing as it relates to you know advocating on behalf of ordinary people and and educating people and that's very important in the public domain because our education is not only what happens at school Thank you so much for that and you know <laughs> i was going to say to you before <laughs> before you big me up that i attended the session the zoom session we uh, advertise that here um, from seven continents on, on neoliberalism and I sat there and I listened to you and I thought wow you just touched on everything but you did more than that you put it into context for us I know the understanding I think is important for us to really move and I'd really really appreciate what you did there wanted to bring it to this space also and I, I see this as one of many interviews if you can find the time but <laughs> <laughs> sure I'm available All right. sometimes anyway but thank you thank yes, you for the yes. good words right I'm going to say to our listeners um, I know how it goes. You called me after the program to say, can I get a copy of this program? And it's fine. Um, it's also fine to record it if you, if you wish. We don't mind. So we, right. want, we want to talk about uh, Jamaica and the neoliberal agenda, neoliberalism. But first of all, help us to understand what is neoliberalism. All right. So I think we all know capitalism, right? I mm-hmm. mean, we live it. Although... If someone were to ask you what is it, um, people might have difficulty explaining. 
Mm-hmm. And pretty simply, you know, it's a system that has governed the world um, since the 15th century, the economic system, which is also political because wealth mediates power. And the source of wealth in capitalism is ownership of property. So mm-hmm. capitalism is based on private ownership of property and the pursuit of profit as a motive for production. Now, you know, people may take for granted that what other form of ownership of property exists. Mm -hmm. First of all, if we look at other societies historically, we would see that people didn't necessarily think that they should own the land. Um, If you look at pre-colonial Africa, for instance, you don't own land. Mm -hmm. You keep land in trust for generations to come and you work the land in a way that is honoring the ancestors and leaving you know it in a state that the future generations can take Mm -hmm. you know Mm -hmm. care of it use of it etc etc so land ownership or property ownership is a distinctly capitalist way of seeing how we relate to the earth and then also each other because The question of, so who must work the land comes in. Mm -hmm. And those who control capital employ labor. Labor works. The surplus value of their labor goes to the capitalists in profit. Mm -hmm. And there is, you know, for those who critique capitalism, there is an inherent problem in that, in that what it's doing is producing poverty in the world, right? Mm -hmm. And we think about in our own situation, we would have lived in a period of unwaged labor, Mm -hmm. slavery, Mm -hmm. and that wealth went to Europe, Mm -hmm. the wealth that was created here. Mm -hmm. So hundreds of years of, you know, accumulation of the wealth of Europeans largely, and we come to 1945, the end of World War II, the world is that, well, the European world is a wreck, although because they had established colonialism elsewhere, the rest of the world is also paying for their wars through extraction of taxation and also bringing people into the war too, right? Mm-hmm. Africans fought, Jamaicans fought, etc. Mm-hmm. I give me a long history. Now, yeah, but, no, but it's, it's relevant. So, it's important for us to understand it within the historical context. Yes. So that's the period of rebuilding for mm-hmm. Europe post-World War II. It's also a period in which labor is strong and labor unions are strong and they are able to negotiate from a position of power to say that working conditions must be improved, Mm -hmm. um, wages must be improved, etc. So the post-1945 period is a period in which there is some redistribution of wealth within capitalism Mm -hmm. that goes downwards and so it tempers capitalism um you know i mean if there's a this film that used to play a lot i think on tv when we were children Mm -hmm. um that showed mine workers in and uh, including children in the uk Mm -hmm. as being you know destitute yes they, though they were in capitalism, people at the bottom were not beneficiaries mm-hmm. in early mm-hmm. capitalism mm-hmm. in Europe and the United States. Mm-hmm. So you have a period, and in the United States, the period of what we would call tempered capitalism is um, accredited to FDR and the youth of Keynesian economics, mm-hmm. which says that you have to um, mediate capitalism in a way that you are protecting people from greed, but you are also giving some social services. The state, particularly, yes. is also playing a role in providing social welfare for people. Mm-hmm. Now, when we come into independence, that's popular. The um, whole world is agreed that the state must play a role in you know, creating conditions of quote-unquote development, mm-hmm. which means that the state must also be an economic player so it can make money that will allow it to make provisions for education, health, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. cash transfer, Welfare. Um, you know, public transport, mm-hmm. all of these yes. things that were considered quote-unquote public goods. Mm-hmm. In the 1970s, there is a debt crisis that is related to the oil crisis, the rising price of oil. We don't set prices for oil. We are 
price takers. We have to spend foreign exchange for that. Um, so when oil prices go up, typically people like us become poorer. Mm. And one of the responses to that was to borrow money from the international financial community. Mm-hmm. That put us in debt. By the end of the 1970s, much of the developing world is heavily indebted. Mm-hmm. And the creditors are concerned about what is going to happen to their money. So they largely, I would put it in terms, devise a plan mm-hmm. that says... Um, we can use the international monetary system to ensure that these developing countries repay the debt. The IMF and World Bank become important in this period in popularizing Mm -hmm. neoliberal economics. Mm -hmm. And neoliberal economics is simply a phase of capitalism that says that the market must be freed Mm -hmm. to do as it pleases. Presumably the market will always find equilibrium Demand and supply should determine all things and the state should not become involved in economic activities because it is actually acting as an obstacle to demand and supply finding the correct price. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So the way that our crisis was explained in the late 1970s was that they said, you know, the problem is that you guys, structure of your economies is problematic and that needs to be fixed through what became known as structural adjustment programs. And the exchange was, we will continue to lend you money and you will continue to pay us interest but you have to adjust your economies in order to allow for your economies to get it right. Mm -hmm. The structural adjustment programs had a one-size-fits-all slew of policies that included um, liberalizing um, trade and liberalizing the domestic market. Liberalizing trade would mean removing subsidies, removing taxes or duties on goods coming in. Um, It would include um, devaluation that would, you know, supposedly get our dollar right. Mm. Um, Similar processes would relate to freeing the market and especially the financial sector Mm -hmm. so that capital could now move freely across borders. Um, Multinational corporations could relocate to places where labor was cheap or I would say cheapened Mm -hmm. and they could now have access to the markets of the entire world. They didn't have to stay in, in the developed world. They could take advantage of any opportunities and that would allow for presumably, um, well, they could accumulate capital and presumably we could now grow because mm-hmm. we too had access to these markets outside and it favored an export driven model of you know large scale um, production. Mm-hmm whether it's in agriculture or manufacturing, or if you don't have economies of scale already, it means that you are going to compete with companies that are have long histories, have significant capital, are able to invest wherever, take advantage of opportunities wherever. And ultimately, mm-hmm. you are entering the fray at a disadvantage mm-hmm. in that kind of economics. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, what is happening is that the state's role becomes no longer we are acting in the interest of the people on the side of democracy, but rather the role of the state becomes we are here to facilitate capital. Mm -hmm. We are here to facilitate the private sector. To facilitate the private sector. Was there at any time, because obviously this this took off, and many many argue that neoliberalism has created the worst income inequality that we have ever seen. It has ravaged Mm -hmm. the Caribbean landscape and has exacted a, a punishing tribute often in the form of dead peonage um, from the working class, and you've, you've kind of outlined some of that. But you, you, you have said that the state, the Jamaican state, is fashioning itself within a neoliberal context, and I'm quoting you directly. You might, rec- yeah. you might recall that. Right. Um, explain that to us. So the neoliberal period is really the 1980s, mm-hmm. and it has lasted since then till now. Mm-hmm. One of the things that the state has to do, or governments who come into control of the state, 
is to justify their existence, right? They have to win elections. They have to tell us what they have done for us and why we should vote for them. And one of the ways that they do it in a context where what we see around us is failure, people are getting poorer, um, presently, you know, crime is expanding. Um, there is very little that we can say, maybe outside of the period um, of the 1970s in which there is a slew of transformations that occur in relation to, you know, ordinary people and legislative reform, mm -hmm. things like maternity leave, etc. Um, so we have to understand how it is that we are not getting better off. Mm -hmm. You tell us that growth is good. We see that growth is anemic, meaning it's very little. But also when growth happens, it doesn't trickle down, as neoliberalism argues that it will. Right. So how is it that we are doing everything and that we're supposed to do, and we are not reaping the benefits? In fact, things mm -hmm. may even seem to be getting worse. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So... Part of the, the reality of neoliberalism is that elites within all societies benefit. If you are well positioned, you can take advantage of opportunities. You don't have to worry about getting into the labor market. You don't have to worry about um, you know whether you have capital to invest, etc. So if you already have capital, you are well placed. And elites within these societies may see themselves more along the lines of elites in the developed world. Mm -hmm. And our governments also play that role of aligning with multinational corporations and global elites. Mm -hmm. So there's a kind of political consensus around what the state should be doing. And then when they fail, they turn the the lens on the public. Mm -hmm. Now, neoliberalism uses a kind of post-truth because what it does is to turn our focus away from structural problems. Yes. So we're no longer looking at histories of inequality and how you fix them. You are looking, um, you're trying to explain reality in a different kind of way. And the way that the Jamaican state has done it is through this language of personal responsibility. It's the mm -hmm. same thing that the IMF and World Bank would have used to explain why we are failing. Mm -hmm. It's because you all are negligent. It's because you all don't know how to do economics. It's because you have some, you know, internal failing mm -hmm. and you need to take responsibility. What It was the language of good governance right. in relation to the state. And in turn the state has turned that on to the people and say they explain their failure by personal responsibility. It's your own fault why you cannot rise out of poverty. It's mm -hmm. your own fault why you have crime. I mean, in the paper today, um, you know, Horace Chang's explanation of the, the problems that we have of violence is the so-called gun culture. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, not, you know, social science understandings that inequality produces crime, mm -hmm. but rather we have some internal understandings of you know, how we should behave and mm -hmm. that is what we should use to mm -hmm. explain everything in the universe basically. Mm -hmm. um, so that's what I mean when I say, you know, the state is fashioning itself, it's aligning itself with mm -hmm. neoliberal mm -hmm. um, dogma, neoliberal ideology in a way that is explaining the world outside of structural explanations towards personal um, responsibility. Mm -hmm. And in this case, failure is explained through the people. And when you talk what about stru so, so, so structural, structural violence, for example. But, but, but let, let, me, let me just ask you a, a little bit. If, could you go back a bit and talk about this idea? Because you, you, you talk about the neoliberalism, uh, neoliberal ideology. We have to understand this as an ideology, as a global um, concept, aren't we? We have to see this within a global context. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm not. And then I'm how to? And then that. and then how to? And then how to connect that back, that back to what we are experiencing here on the ground? Is it divorced from um, a, 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 a greater plan then? 
outside I'm of saying. Sure I understand it quickly. No, because you, you you talk about all right. Here's the thing. Um, you talk about it be, neoliberalism being an ideology, and I wanted to mm-hmm. understand that concept. It, it, this is this is not a this is not a buck up. This is this this is okay. this is a serious. Um, it's a serious. This is an ideology that is that is that has taken root across the world, and it's global. Right. So um, neoliberalism presents itself as not ideological, right? Mm. As just doing business, as just economics. But if we look at it, we will see that it is in fact you know, value, it has value attached to it. It's not value free. Mm -hmm. And the particular values that it advances are, you know, a kind of preference for the market as determining, you know, the market should, should, has its own logic and we should accept that and we should accept that it is correct. It's also going back to Margaret Thatcher, who was one of its proponents, um, in the political realm, the kind of idea that says society does not exist. Individuals exist. And the focus should always be on individuals. And so you destroy collective um, organizing frames like unions and tell people that you should be entrepreneurs, free your entrepreneurial spirit and that's the way to the future. And we begin to think of ourselves in that kind of way, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you talk to any young person, what do you want to be? Well, they might say a business scammer, but that's a kind Mm -hmm. of entrepreneur Mm -hmm. because in our case, the reason why that kind of entrepreneur emerges is because again of structural inequalities what are the opportunities for people to legitimately find means in the the talk you know i think that it's important for us to to think about our context in terms of race Mm -hmm. and the history of race in our societies Mm -hmm. in our case um blackness is also defining how we think about ourselves and the kinds of values that are attached to that Mm-hmm. There's always a question for us, you know, what is the worth of a black person? And that is attached to economics as well. What do you do with these people when you're done with them mm-hmm. in slavery? Mm-hmm. In the United States, you can incarcerate them and put them to work, right? Here, because of our place in the global economy, there is, it's, we don't know what to do with these bodies. Mm-hmm. Um, they become unemployed. And because we are not invested in education in, well, that's a different conversation, but um, they are also oftentimes unemployable. And so they find themselves having to create their own context. Mm -hmm. Also, historically, the Jamaican state has not been committed to really transforming this society. Mm -hmm. So people become hustlers of various sorts. Um, If they can go into music, that's legitimate. But if they're going to scam in, it's something else, and we have mm-hmm. to deal with the violence of that. Mm-hmm. But there's a way that we think about ourselves, you know, in a kind of branded entrepreneurial um, frame that fits into the market logic that says, you know, if we fix ourselves at the individual level, um, mm-hmm. we can advance. Mm-hmm. And when I say that that is ideological, I mean that there is a politics embedded within that that is really based in individualism Mm -hmm. and individualism Mm -hmm. as the ways that our societies Mm -hmm. are being increasingly Mm -hmm. um you know and, uh, and one of the things, yeah. one of the things I heard you say in that um, presentation also is that black governments themselves um, participate in the cheapening of black labor through the rebirth of, of things like the BPOs. And I wanted to go there a bit to talk about um, how how uh, labor and neoliberalism, and especially within the Jamaican context. Um, Mm -hmm. You mentioned unions just now, and a a light bulb went off in my head because I've been asking the question, what happened to the unions? You know, know, so so let's talk about that. Mm -hmm. Governments participated in union busting. Mm -hmm. Margaret Thatcher's union busting was, she took down the strongest union in the UK, which would have been the minor's union, right? Mm -hmm. Um, Unions, part of the problem with unions in our society is that they were connected to the political parties. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. there is always a question, you know, how can you have 
a independent union that is also attached to the political party. What is going to be their agenda? Is it for the people or is it aligned with the political party? Mm -hmm. And that is, you know, a kind of inherent contradiction that exists here. But as it relates to the BPOs, um, the question is, so what is it that we imagine to be the fate of these black people who have been long suffering, right? What is it that we are putting in place to change their realities on the ground? And we have come up with tourism, Mm. um, extractive economies, largely is how we operate, and and scholars like George Beckford would have called this plantation economics, um, in that the same model that is based on low wage, in the case of slavery, it would have been free labor, Mm -hmm. but... It's the same model that is low wage, extractive in the sense that profits go abroad. So you have, you know, um, if you think about the, even the ownership of tourism currently, um, I don't know, I don't have the statistics, but you know that there are significant international players. Of course. Yes. Um, and we see, you know, who mm-hmm. is putting up hotels. And of course, there's the issue there of, so while you are building hotels along the coast and you are employing black people as low-wage workers who are also contract workers, which mean, means that they have no protections, and you are at the same time denying them access to the resources of the nation because they can't even go to the beach. Mm-hmm. Um, so the privatization, which is a part of neoliberalism, mm-hmm. the privatization of public assets, the enrichment of individuals at the expense of the poor, both in terms of, you know, what they can have access to, but also the way in which their labor is used Mm -hmm. comes into question. In the the early neoliberal period of the 1980s, you had export processing zones where, you know, these factories would come in, set up the textile sector, really. In Haiti, it was the most oppressive, most advanced um, in the Caribbean taking advantage of low wages here and then, you know, exporting these brand name clothes for um, that are sold in the developed market for significant profit. And of course, you know, it's women. It's mm-hmm. women who mm-hmm. labor stays mm-hmm. in these sectors because in our society especially, women are 51% of households are headed by women. They're taking care of families. You know, what is the chance that they're going to opt out of whatever is available to them? Mm -hmm. Um, They're going to accept low wages and they are going to be producing, you know, brand name goods that they can't themselves buy. And if not that, because the question is what is available to them in terms of work, they're going to be leaving Jamaica and migration has always been important for us, right, as a source Mm of improving our economic standing. And they're also leaving their families behind. So mm-hmm. there, are, there are consequences attached to that, that they are social. Yes, yes. And the structure of the economy ultimately is not changing. It's not creating possibilities beyond the historical place of places like Jamaica in the global economy. And we mm-hmm. remain poor. We remain, you know, people don't use the language of oppression too much these days mm-hmm, because mm-hmm. if you accept personal responsibility then you aren't oppressed mm-hmm. but in my understanding this is what people are right uh, and and you talk about the dependence also on agriculture uh, the shifting from the dependence on agriculture to to tourism as part of um the um neoliberal project that we see or agenda that we right. see um here on the island it's a certain kind of agriculture that gets a pass in neoliberalism. It's large-scale um, agriculture for export. Mm-hmm. Um, so it means that, you know, small farmers will only benefit to a certain degree in that kind of model. But if we think about the needs of the internal economy, that is, you know, we saw in COVID, for example, that a lot of farmers had this massive buildup of um tomatoes, things like tomatoes. Mm -hmm. That's because they were farming for the hotel sector. They weren't farming for the local needs of the population. So you have 
farmers that are competing in the local market with imported produce um, because in the neoliberal period it says you can't subsidize even while the U.S. government is subsidizing, subsidizing heavily its dairy sector, its rice sector, its agriculture overall, we don't get to do that. And we accept many of these ideas. A lot of it is imposed, you know, by IMF agreements, etc. But we also are not negotiating alternate terms, partly because I think we are not doing the work of thinking about how we could transform these societies. And if we look at a sector like agriculture, it's not just about producing food. It's also that people who are farming are living on their land. So agriculture is providing shelter for them at the same time. Mm -hmm. They're being able to feed themselves. There is There are multiple economies that are attached to it. Mm -hmm. But we are oriented towards export markets, um, service sector, and the service sector is the BPO, the tourism, um, you know, for instance. And I would argue that the economy is not oriented towards dealing with our basic needs in this society. Mm -hmm. So you have people in Jamaica, I mean, people cannot, are not guaranteed three meals a day. And even if they are eating, what are they eating? Mm-hmm. So we're not even food secure. Right. Uh, and that's a whole other conversation. Um, right. the, the, so, so then it, it leads me to think of the consequences of neoliberalism then in the, in the current pandemic. Um, y- your own thinking on that? So to me, it was an opportunity for us to rethink, right? Uh, yes, I get that we are not powerful in the world, etc. But you have to take advantage of space when it is created. And the space that is created sometimes is just that the developed world is not, and America in particular, the U.S. in particular, is not paying attention to you. Mm-hmm. So one of the things that Mia Motley has done in Barbados is to use the pandemic to call for things like rethinking international debt. Mm-hmm. Because the logic of the debt arrangement is such that we will be perpetually squeezed. And when Nigel Clark says, we can't do anything about this, it's not true. Because oh. these arrangements are negotiated, right? And in Mia's case, what she did was to reduce the surplus, the, the fiscal surplus. So they said, you know, we're not going to be holding all this money in reserve while people are not eating. Mm-hmm. We are going to do something else with our society and if we don't take opportunities like these that say oh my god the whole world is suffering it means that we should focus on people Mm -hmm. then we lose that opportunity and we continue along in the same path in which all that has has happened is that conditions have worsened Mm -hmm. so people are even worse off and they were not good well you know in any good condition before because the pandemic produces its own, you know, logic of inequality and people who don't have means are the ones who suffer mm-hmm. most. Mm-hmm. Can you hold a line for me, please, Dr. Thim? A quick sure. break and we'll be right back. Right, we're back with you inside of the Africa Forum. It is Running Africa, and my very special guest online is Dr. Mazika Thim. She is a senior lecturer in the Institute of Gender and Development Studies at the University of the West Indies. We're talking about Jamaica and the neoliberal agenda, learning so much in, in, in the session. Um, Dr. Thim, how does neoliberalism envision social justice? Because we talked about, um, as an economic system, it was about the freedom of the market. But, but how does it envision social justice? Well, I wouldn't say social justice is um, a part of the neoliberal framing because if you accept Margaret Thatcher's notion that there is no, thing, no such thing as a society, then mm-hmm. what are we talking about when we talk about the social? Mm. The, we move from the social to the individual. Mm -hmm. And the individual is expected to do the work of improving their own conditions. Mm -hmm. If you, in neoliberalism, the understanding is if you free the market and entrepreneurial spirit, etc., etc., then you'll have growth and growth will trickle down. Mm -hmm. So it's in the trickle down that we are, 
you know, supposedly getting better off. Mm, so this is so 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 hence social inequality and increasing inequalities in the world. Precisely, and the inequality is both between nations and within nations. Mm -hmm. So poor countries have gotten poorer, and internally, um, inequality has increased. And if you look at the, the in, even in the COVID pandemic, you have you know individuals who have gotten significantly richer. The, people who are already rich able to you know put their money in mm -hmm. the financial sector and people you know play the stock exchange etc mm -hmm. and get richer if you have capital mm -hmm. um so yeah the the inequality is is mm -hmm. statistically rising everywhere Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, um, in in the in the presentation you made, um, some of the things you referenced, which I want to in the last um, ten minutes that we have to kind of uh, look at, um, you talk about the production of the unemployed, and also about the overproduction of uh, uh, the unemployable, the failure of a state. Um, backed by violence, um, which is a feature of of neoliberalism. Uh, can you elaborate on that a bit in this space? All right, so when I'm, we have to think about the way in which neoliberalism was imposed in the first place. And Chile is the first test case. Um, when it happened in Chile, it happened via a coup that removed the President Allende from power and installed um, Pinochet. And the privatization of everything, the market logic followed. But it followed in a context of, you know, putting a stop to expressions of, of social discontent. Mm -hmm. Essentially authoritarian government backed by the United States. And the U.S. is always present in our politics, right, in the region mm -hmm. and, and globally, of course. So there's a force that happens at that level in terms of the imposition of neoliberalism against the will of the people. In addition to that, the violence occurs, and I think of it as such, when the IMF is able to tell us how to govern. There's a certain inherent violence involved in that. It's anti-democratic. Yeah. Um, when you have international agencies managing your state, when people have other ambitions for themselves. In our case, because you have a history of inequality, a history of poverty, etc. The work of independent state, if you want to, to, to change the context means you have to deal with the histories. You have to seek to transform those histories in various different ways. And one of the ways that has been very important in Jamaica is, of course, the expansion of education, the democratization of education. Mm -hmm. But somewhere along the line, education became a means of weeding children out of the process. Mm -hmm. It occurs very early, right? Um, you know, with all these exams that they have to take in order to get to high school and to get a bet better education and ultimately to move up in the system. So at 11 years old, your future is almost decided in this society, right? Mm -hmm. And if education is a means to social mobility. Many people would contest that, especially presently, because you have university graduates who remain, let's say, if at best, precariously middle class. Mm -hmm. And that, that is partly due to our location in the global economy. But none the, it is also due to the kind of attention that we have paid to education that is quite happy to allow for children to fail and to fail very early. Mm -hmm. And when they become adults, they are unable to fit in to the formal structures of employment. So the, the informal sector is very large in Jamaica, not just, not just the criminal sector in the sense of people who are engaged in, um, you know, activities that we focus on when it comes to criminality, because in my mind, criminality stretches beyond what happens in the you know the, the the process whereby someone kills someone else and mm -hmm. we incarcerate them etc mm -hmm. there's also an informal sector that is 
based in, you know, just small scale hustling where people are selling Kalalo on the street for the whole day long and what do they end up with in the end, right? Mm-hmm. So they, there is a kind of structural violence there of neglect, of um, the refusal to attend to the history of inequality that, you know, needs to be fixed. But also because it produces this sector that is unable to advance in the formal it means that in the case of Jamaica, it has meant that um, these sectors are high competition, they're dangerous. You're talking about transnational drug trade, you're talking about a lot of scamming, you're talking about various forms of scamming. And in that process, you, and this is related to our history too of political violence. I don't want to say that it's only um, based in the economic process. Mm-hmm. But there is a violence produced in it that the state has to respond to. And it's mm-hmm. a violence that is, I would say, horizontal, you know, um, in terms of who is at risk. It's poor people who are, who experience predation. Mm-hmm. Um, and the state has responded with its own violence against not, not just the criminals themselves, yes. but entire communities that are criminalized, mm-hmm. are stigmatized um, because of their historical location in our society. And, and now we see, and now we see a, a, a situation where the, the, the police is being militarized. And I find this very interesting. Well, well policing mm-hmm. is militarized. Mm-hmm. So the JDF is playing an important role. Mm -hmm. There is an expansion of the funding available to the JDF. The JDF is being deployed in the streets. And one of the ways that you can do this or justify it is through this notion that we are in a state of emergency Mm -hmm. because it gives extraordinary powers to the state. Mm -hmm. And we are to understand that we are in an extraordinary moment requiring extraordinary um, responses and the response is not a social one. It's not about fixing the inequality. It's one that is about putting down communities and people. Mm-hmm. Um, because it's not necessarily criminals that experience this, right? It's the people who are living in the zones that are determined to be criminal. Mm-hmm. The whole communities are stigmatized in this process. And it's because we have already thought of those communities in that way that we think it is appropriate to handle them in that way. And there's before the, the violence rate was what it is, this is also the history of our independence. I mean, the 1960s and the back of all, um, the removal of so-called squatters, mm-hmm. um, the construction of housing units you know i mean if you read the newspapers of the day the way they describe the the way these communities were burned out women were living with their children in maypen cemetery um because they had nowhere to go yeah. and that kind of violence is a part of how we have managed our people leading mm-hmm. up to the present and mm-hmm. we take it for granted that we deserve it mm. you know i'm jumping all over the place here and i, I need to get in a few more things um, with just four minutes um but the one of the things that you underscored um in, in your presentation was the collapse of the independence uh, project as we go into our 60th year um take a minute which i know is unfair to you um to, to help our listeners to understand that the collapse of the independence project even as we go into 60 60 years of uh, independence so called well i don't know let's say the the collapse of the decolonial project more so than the independence project because mm-hmm. the independence project you know is a particular kind of middle class brown nationalist creole nationalist project mm-hmm. that is constructing the nation in a in a in a way that legitimizes brown rule for instance um mm-hmm. and you know mm-hmm. That's not necessarily decolonialist de- decolonization. Yes, decolonization would be about you know contending with the legacy of colonialism and doing away with it. And we we see expressions of it um, in the treatment of Nzinga, for instance. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Even before she gets into the jail cell, you know the way how she is treated on the streets. Mm-hmm. 
why do we believe that it is acceptable mm-hmm. that the police should treat ordinary people in the way that they do and then we justify it on the basis that the woman wasn't wearing a mask mm. um and ultimately for me the independence or decolonization project has to do with restoring the dignity of black people who are a majority in this society and who experience the worst conditions particularly when they are, are poor and i don't know that we are there are reversals that have come within the neoliberal period that kind of justify it on the basis that, you know, if black people have nothing to show for their struggles, etc., they may rely on this idea that says that something is wrong with them. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, there is no alternative if if it is the, if the problem is that it's mm-hmm. personal responsibility mm-hmm. that is at stake. Um, and a lot of work has to go into transforming this society around the dignity of black people who are the people who experience oppression in this society, even the, though it's black majority. With the Jamaican government being such an active participant in the neoliberal project, how do we realize this? Does it take a revolution to make a solution? Well, it certainly takes a revolution in ideas. Mm-hmm. It takes um, some real serious rethinking of, you know, how the state positions itself in the world and how it positions itself in relation to people and also for people to figure out by some means what is really at stake and to take some action around it. We cannot be satisfied with receiving remittances as the way of the future. We should not be satisfied with feeding everything to foreigners, the beach, the mountains, the cockpit, the, you know, whatever it is. They, I think ordinary people don't necessarily believe in a Jamaican project. You know, they don't necessarily believe in Jamaica and themselves. And so the Jamaican dream is, how can I get to foreign? And for me, that's a problem because mm-hmm. obviously you're going to face problems there too. But also we have something and we have, you know, Jamaican people, even though they are full of problems, they're also taking care of each other. And if we are able to build on the things that we do well, the tremendous talent that shows itself, you know, despite the odds, Mm -hmm. um, then that's a place to start. Um, So the revolution doesn't necessarily come in the, you know, the way we imagined it thinking through chair and you know mm-hmm. taking up arms against revolution and whatnot. It, it comes first of all with a shift in the paradigm right, right? rethinking how we yeah. value ourselves and yes. what we demand for ourselves in the nation well, let us start that process. I want to continue this conversation with you, Dr. Them, if you don't mind. And uh, we'll just reach out to you again. I know this has to be a series. When I heard you, I, I, I figured that immediately. And this is just like an introductory um, discussion. And we, we'll kind of zoom in at, on different aspects of it when we talk next. All right, Kabu. Th- thank you, thank you so much. Me. Thank you so much. All right. Take uh, care. Yeah, you too. Dr. Maziki. Um, same there. Wow, wow. What a lot, what a lot, what a lot to, to mull over, to unpack, to just think about. What a lot. Um, you've heard it. Does it make a difference when you understand what the, when you can name, when you can name the thing? Does it make a difference when you can name it? Because you have to name it. You have to name it to diagnose it. And you have to name it to treat it. So now that we know that we are in a neoliberal project, that the Jamaican government is an active participant in this project, the more we understand about the project and the more we understand about the agenda, is the better able we are to deal with the problems and they are many but the solution is also right in the problem and usually you know the solution is usually in the problem 
You're inside of the Africa Forum. It is Running Africa, and we're standing by now to speak with our next guest. And uh, she is also no stranger to the Africa Forum. Going to be talking to her about her books on Miss Lou and Portia, Dr. Opal Palmer Adissa, coming up in a minute. All right, uh, let's go to the phone lines where my next very special guest is standing by. She's a former university director of the Institute for Gender and Development Studies, Regional Coordinating Office, University of the West Indies, Mona. Cultural activist, award-winning poet, novelist, performance artist, and educator, Dr. Opal Adissa, Palmer Adissa, is standing by online. Uh, good morning. Good morning, Dr. Opal good Palmer morning. Adissa. Good morning. You're sounding loud Good and morning. clear. <laughs> <laughs> you're sounding as if you're in the room, in the studio. Uh, beautiful. Well, that's great. I want to thank you and to say good morning to you. Uh, thank you so much, my sister. Good to have you in the space as usual. Here's the thing. I have, I sat down and I read um, Portia, the book on Portia, right? Why, why am I losing? Uh-huh. Why am I losing the title? All right. Um, Portia dreams. Portia dreams. And listen to me, you drew me in. Um, it is <laughs> awesomely written. Um, you know, I, I just, I, I, I was, it, it, I was drawn into the story. Let me just say, and I, I, I was there with Portia um, it, through her childhood. Um, in Marley Hill, I went to church, I went to school, you know, I ate the cornmeal pudding, I see the butterflies, <laughs> <laughs> I went to feel with the father, grandfather, so, so really beautiful. Now, I wanted to, uh, two books we're talking about today, Portia Dreams mm-hmm. and, and, and the anthology of Miss Lou. Miss but, Lou. Right, mm-hmm. so let me start with Portia Dreams, though, because um, this is about a, a Portia Simpson Miller, isn't it? It is, it is. And I'm very grateful that I had the opportunity. And I don't think I would have been able to write the book with such details if I had not actually visited where she grew up. Mrs. Simpson Miller took me on two different occasions up Mm -hmm. to where she went, Mm -hmm. grew up. So I had that opportunity to walk the streets, to sit at the house and look at the hill and to visit the school and one of the churches that she attended. And so it has been filled with that environment that allowed for me to write the story. Plus I had come up with like 30 questions for her, which Mm -hmm. she answered. Mm -hmm. And I interviewed her older brother and sister and a niece Mm -hmm. and uh, another person who knew her from she was 15. So, um, you know, in order to write a biography and to really try and capture the person's life, you need that process. You need to know yes. where they grew up, mm-hmm. what food they like, what was their family life like, what was the environment like, because I think environment shapes so many uh, of who we are, you know. Mm-hmm. So that was really important for me to have that experience. Yeah. It's, it's really delightful, you know, the way you told that story, and I think you did justice to it. Um, I, it it's, it's all so, so, so careful. But it's, 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 uh, it's a children's book. What, what age group are you, are you targeting? It's 7 to 10, you know, mm. and I think in Jamaica we need to know more about people who are our history makers. Mm-hmm. I mean, all of us are history makers, but for Mrs. Portia Simpson Miller to have become Prime Minister, the first female Prime Minister in Jamaica, that's a very important historical moment which the world celebrates and not all of us necessarily celebrate it here, unfortunately. So I wanted, one of the things Miss Miller said to me, that she loved children and she wanted children to know that regardless of where they come from, just like her from the rural hills Mm -hmm. of St. Catherine, that they can achieve and aspire Mm-hmm. Right. So that was the goal she had in mind. And yes. I set out to capture that goal by saying this is her life. Yeah. I mean, when you think about it, you know, there are 11 of them who lived in that small house. Yes. Right. <laughs> which uh, but then you, us you, now. Yes. Go ahead. Go ahead. I said, which for us now, when you think about it, it's 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 we would consider that poor. Right. Yes. Because how can 11 people live in a little three house, three bedroom house? But mm-hmm. that was what it is. Right. She's saying, I came from this beginning and I am proud of it. And you too, coming from wherever you're coming from in Jamaica, 
you too can aspire to be the high at the highest level. And you managed to capture that love among them, though that love, the love that was in that house, um, to the point that when um, you write about the death of her grandfather, I think it was um, that uh-huh. that that we also mourned, and and we felt um, uh, you, you, this is exactly where you pulled us in a serious way. You know, when Portia herself couldn't. Um, understand when she was told, I think she was six or something like that, mm-hmm. when she was told yes, that her granddad yes. had died and she was in, she, she wanted to go in to, to, to talk to him as usual uh, after school. Um, but, but then you managed to capture the, the, the general love though in this space, which was really, really beautiful. Was the yes, and this is what I found. This is really what I found speaking to her siblings. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, that there was a connection and a love. And another thing that, you know, might be debatable is, although in Jamaica it won't, you know, we always talk about dreams. When I was growing up, my mother always used to say she'd dream her father who was dead. Of course. And for yeah. her dream, she had, you know, she had dreams that she had aspired to for herself. But mm-hmm. she also, when she related the dream about her maternal grandfather, mm-hmm. whom she had met, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. what her mother said to me, mm-hmm. to her, you know, for me, it was important that those details, those cultural nuances yes. be shared. Yeah. Um, great work on that. You know, um, congratulations on the book. Uh, uh, Thank it, you. It, it's, it's, how can we get a copy of this book? How can children get it? But before, before you tell us that, there's also something else in the book, right? Um, um, in that there uh-huh. are questions, there are questions at the end <laughs> um, that yeah. uh, you know I tried answering myself. I was so much into this thing, <laughs> you know. <laughs> but the questions, good for you. Yes, I, <laughs> I answered every single one. <laughs> but um, okay. you, you, you can't help but do that though when you're through, um, because it's just enough time. Um, it's a children's book, uh, small enough and and you know just long enough. And then when you get to the end, you read those questions. Was it important? And to, to put those questions in because you're thinking this this is going to be used in the schools. Yes, that for me was very important. I actually had more <laughs> questions, and they thought it was too many. No, you could have put so them. So it was really important. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It was really important for me to have those questions because I don't just want children to read. I yeah. want them to think and to see what it is that they get from the book. So yeah. those questions, that's the educator part of me, yes, um, yes. are really important. Yeah. Yes, and the goal is that these books will get to kids, particularly mm. children in the rural areas. Yes. You know, and so the books are available at Kingston Bookstore, at Sangster's Bookstore, at uh, Fantana Bookstore. They're mm-hmm. also available through the foundation. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, we're asking people, I asked all my friends, I said, whatever primary school or prep school you went to, please buy 10 yes. or as many books as you can afford I and really- distribute it. I recommend this book. Believe me, I recommend this book. Um, it is about Portia Simpson Miller. It is about a young girl uh, who grew up in a deep rural area of Jamaica. Family we can all identify with for those of us who grew up in a country. But then how she, her first, what I liked about what you did also was how she inadvertently, accidentally <laughs> um, got into into politics through somebody, uh-huh. you know, somebody was sick and couldn't write the notes and also, uh, write, take the notes for a meeting. Uh, I think that's where it started, isn't it? That's where she said it started and, and her, her, as again, as I said, her siblings confirmed that, mm-hmm. that she was always inquisitive and always wanting to know what others were doing mm-hmm. and, you know, would be listening in when her father and her mother had these community meetings and that's mm-hmm. where that idea of mm-hmm. service and mm-hmm. contributing came and from t- and yeah. so, yes. She took the minutes for the meeting um, because somebody wasn't able, somebody was ill. Um, the, Ill. Adult, the adult was ill. She was only 12 years old at the time. And she took mm-hmm. the first minute, mm-hmm. she took the second minute, and then don't just put her in it. The lady said to her, well, listen now, you see, Portia, you are at the minutes, right? <laughs> <laughs> so I like that. Another thing I liked about it too is that you, 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 sh- you carried us to, to that political meeting and uh, just by the way told us that the man who, you, who lifted you up and spoke to you was Norman Manley. <laughs> you <know>? All right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was, yeah. Uh, I was quite... 
you know, I try to, you know, one of the things you also do in a, in a, on a biography is you yes. try to verify that information. Mm-hmm. And although I wasn't necessarily able to verify it, you know, I got that information from several of her family members. And mm-hmm. so, you know, it, it's there. It's yes, there. It's there. Um, a beautiful book. Love it. Get it for your children. Read it. It's really nice. And, and the, the years we're looking at um, for, for Portia's age, it was from when to when? From, can- from she was six until she left to come to kindergarten to high school mm-hmm. so that went when she was about 14. Mm-hmm. Right, so it's that period. That's a period we don't hear a, a lot about. We don't know a lot about, but uh, we learn so much in the book. Now, the other book is uh, on Miss Lou, and this is a bigger book. Um, I have, <laughs> obviously, I have not read that book yet. I don't have a copy of it, by the way. Um, so I need my copy. <laughs> but this is, this is poetry for the most part. So um, you've, got the, the, you've got most of Jamaica's... Um, uh, top poets and, and so on. They're in. They're this. How did you manage to get all? They're in this. Do you know? Do you, do you know, Opal, that I interviewed you when you when you came up with the idea for this book? You know, or Miss Lou. I know, yes. and I want to also thank you and Irie FM because you were such an important part of the Miss Lou Centennial that mm-hmm. I hosted at the university. So yes. big up and thank you. Thank you. Mm-hmm. I just reached out to people. You know, um, a number of people know me because I've been around and I've written. And I just, you know, what them say, you fast, you feel your face, stare your nose, there, whatever, right, yes. whatever it is. <laughs> I just reach out because yes. I knew I wanted a piece by Lorna, and Lorna was hemming and hawing. I said, mm-hmm. Lorna, listen. Listen, you knew Miss Lou. You li- you lived at Garden Town. I interviewed you many many years ago when you were at Garden Town. Come on, yes, um, yes. you know, and, and that's really how it happened. Mm-hmm. I know Clinton Quasi Johnson. I know Kwame does. You know, so mm-hmm. that's partly reaching out to people, mm-hmm. but also you know, people when they heard that the book was happening, people initially at first, people had said to me, someone had said to me. What a way, ambitious! You can't get one hundred good voices for Miss Lou. I ah. said, "Watch me." <laughs> <laughs> I think you did. <laughs> so, <laughs> listen, listen. We have a hundred plus voices, and we've yes. got about a hundred and seventy-two submissions wow. from many people angry with me because I left them out. <laughs> well, well, I can just imagine. I'm looking at it, and I say, "You know that I interviewed her. She told me about this book, and I and I didn't even submit a poem." <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You should. you and a few other people who should have been in there and yes, didn't. So I the didn't. next time I tell you I'm doing an anthology, I expect you to contribute. <laughs> yes, I'm not going to be so lazy. I swear I'm not going to be so lazy. Because I'm looking at the book and I'm saying, but everybody's here. Who's not here? I know Cheryl Mo- Natural, Malachi Smith, Muta you know, Baruka. Andre Bonner, Muta yes. Baruka. Yeah. I mean, come on, Donna Hope. All Look of here. these people are there. Look here, everybody in there. Velma Pollard, yeah. Jean Small, I yeah. mean, Kevin Ollie's, Ormsby. Yeah. yeah. You I, know, they're all there. They're it's there. So, mm-hmm. so let me just tell you a little, again, another yes. story, right? Yes. So. When I was doing my dissertation in 87, um, mm-hmm. I came to interview Miss Lou. This was just before she, I met, I interviewed her in 87 and 88. Mm-hmm. And I had wanted at that time to do a biographer of her, but this other woman had approached her before and said she wanted to do a biography. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I did my dissertation. I did a chapter on her and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And... Um, when her centennial was around, coming around and I realized that the book never came out. The woman never finished the project. I couldn't oh, contact her. Mm-hmm. And I said, I wanted to fulfill a promise I made to Miss Lou. And Miss Lou is, let me tell you something. My poems and stories having the Jamaican nation language are Papua because of Miss Lou. Mm-hmm. She, it is her vision and her force that made me feel brave enough because I grew up at a time, as you might know, when the Jamaican nation language was not respected. Mm-hmm, People still have mm-hmm, some issue with it, mm-hmm. but for the most part, right? Mm-hmm. If you spoke Jamaican in at school, at Wilmers, where I went, you could mm-hmm. get a detention. I know. As a matter of fact, you know, remember your story, because stick a, a stick a pin. <laughs> uh-huh. um, the, I, I thought about that when I read um, Portia Dreams, by the way. You didn't use the Jamaican nation language. Was that deliberate? Yes, I had in the draft that I mm-hmm. first sent to Miss, Mrs. Miller mm-hmm. that they were speaking in, in, in Patwa because mm-hmm. I figured, you know, whatever. Right. She said to me that her mother did not allow them to speak in Patwa oh. and therefore I should take it out. Wow. Wow. Interesting. Wow. 
Um, yes. Good point. And I know it's a mm-hmm. question. I'm glad you raised that question yes. because I know it's a question people are going to ask because one of the criticism, mm-hmm. and this is what I said to Mrs. Simpson Miller, but mm-hmm. people always say, oh, you speak Jamaican. She said, but when I was growing up, mm-hmm. my mother, who was, I guess, half white, Irish or whatever, mm-hmm. did not allow us to speak. If she caught us mm-hmm. speaking it, especially when we were going to church or stuff, mm-hmm. she would scold us. And that's so another... Do not... Yeah. It's another thing to note, as you mentioned, her racial makeup, because when she had the dream of her grandfather, she actually dreamed of a a, a white man. White. She, with her right. father said that. Yeah, it. which was her much. Mm-hmm. Right. All right, sorry about that, because I interrupted. Um, You were talking about No, no, that's week. okay, mm-hmm. because mm-hmm. that's an important point to segue yes. into now, Miss mm-hmm. Lou, where mm-hmm. so much of it, almost all of it, not almost all of it, but a lot of it is about nation language because Miss mm-hmm. Lou was a champion, mm-hmm. right? And uh, so she was about that. She influenced people like Muta Baruch and the dub poets in mm-hmm. using Jamaican language. And I think that's really when the Jamaican language the turn from the, mm-hmm. the mighty, Mike Smith, the Muta Baruch, who mm-hmm. said, no, man, this is Fui language and mm-hmm. we're going to use it just like Miss Lou and spread it out. Yes, yes. Um, so it was important for me, for that, so you know, the tributes to Miss Lou by the various poets are written in Jamaican nation language, mm-hmm. which is why I did not um, submit one because I don't know if I can re- write in the Jamaican nation language. I don't think I have. Well, one. you know, I yeah. write in a. I write in a. It's it's like um, what's his name? I think I'm blanking his name now. Who corrects my my Jamaican nation <laughs> language? Because you know it's how I hear it, right? Yes, but yes. it's not necessarily right. Mm-hmm. So I always, whenever I'm having another children's book that's coming out next year, and I sent it yes. to the, the the Jamaican language unit for mm-hmm. corrections, mm-hmm. so that it could uh, be more in accordance yeah, with, yeah, that. with that. And one of the things you know that you'll find in this book is that. There is a continuum because we, yeah. you know, all of us speak in a continuum anyway. Some people speak. I went to Portland uh, last year, and I'm telling you, some people were speaking, and I was like, "Wait, Opal, you know Jamaican? Why is it you're not understanding?" Yes, because every parish, because every parish of them own accent. My mama tell you. <laughs> yes, yes, and I could not understand. These three men were speaking, and I was yes. struggling to understand. And yes. So we speak in a continuum depending mm. on our education and our class right, level. Right. I'm so looking forward to, to, to I'm looking forward to reading the book. Where is it available? Um Miss Lou? 100 the, Voices. The book is Okay, so 100 Voices for Miss Lou, Big Up UE Press and Big mm-hmm. Up the Institute of the Institute for Gender and Development Studies. Mm-hmm. Uh the book is available at UE Press and it's going to be because the next the last ship a shipment came in this week. It's going to be also at Kingston's book San the book and um, uh, Fantana. Uh, mm-hmm. So it's going to be at all those bookstores. But for right now, uwepress.com, call them. You know, you can go and pick up your copy. All right. They, um, the book it's was a delayed have. because. Yes. Mm-hmm. It's a, listen, it's a must have yes. for people who can afford it. It's an expensive book because it's 400 and something pages. I thought mm-hmm. it was going to be 200 pages mm-hmm. and it turned out to be double. And yes. for me, it's a book for high school and colleges and universities and for everybody. Uh, and for people who can afford it, again, I'm saying, you know, get these books out to people. Yeah. Donate a to a library, a donate to school. If mm-hmm. you can afford it, please do. We're going to um, put them on our Running you know, African um, book list or, or book club, a Running African book club reading list uh, as soon as, well, I, we've read Portia Dream, so I'm putting that on immediately. Get that for the, so the children can read that for the Running African book club. And then once we get a copy of 100 um, Voices for Miss Lou, then we'll put that on. Thank you so much, Excellent. Dr. Opal Palmer. Thank I did you. Uh, great work, great work. We appreciate you thank all the time. Thank you for your work and thank you for your support. Thank it's you really so much, much appreciated. Sister. All right. Have a good one. All right. You have a great day now. You too. Peace. Hey, by the way, we're just eight minutes to go inside of the program. Have you heard that um, a presidential aide said that talks took place amid unprecedented U.S. hysteria between Russia and Biden yesterday. Russia, revealing the details of the Biden-Putin call, um, said that the Kremlin foreign policy aide um, said the conversation 
with Putin and the U.S. counterpart uh, concluded Saturday evening. Speaking to reporters during a press me- meeting, they revealed that the talks were staged on Washington's request with the U.S. citing fears of an allegedly imminent invasion of Ukraine by Russia. The Biden-Putin talks were originally scheduled to take place on Monday, but the conversation came amid an atmosphere of unprecedented hysteria by U.S. officials over Russia's supposedly imminent invasion of Ukraine. Ukraine is saying, you're saying that there's an imminent invasion, but you have not showed us any evidence of this. So Ukraine is really mad. But here's the thing. Have you heard that when... Um, the French um, President uh, Macron, that when he went to Russia to meet with, uh, to meet with, oops, I'm still on that. <laughs> when he went to Russia to meet with the, with, with Putin, that he refused to take the COVID test. And he refused to take the COVID test because he said that he did not want Russia to get his DNA so this, there's a lot in there for us to unpack and a lot in there for us, right, to understand. French President Macron um, did not take the PCR test over fears that the Russians would get hold of his DNA. Now, if Macron did not take the test because he no not want Russia to get him DNA, then can you imagine what has happened to all of us DNA who have taken the PCR because Macron says that, um, let me see what he says here. The conditions imposed on the meeting to take place with no social distancing. Uh, the Hold on, I'm going to get it. I'm going to get it for you. He was scared of taking the PCR because he says he doesn't want them. It's, 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 it's reported all over the place you now, so if you can get it. Um, A lot of leaders, they say he's not the only leader not to have taken a PCR because these leaders are afraid that their DNAs will be with other countries. And I'm so sorry I can't find, with just a few minutes to go, what he actually said. Well, anyway, we know that people have been, they've been warning for persons to be careful um, what they share, arguing that the DNA is the most valuable thing you own. And this was another thing from Macron. All right. The test required a health protocol that was unacceptable, he said, and did not fit with the French president's schedule. It follows report that he himself, Macron, refused a PCR test over fears that the Russians would get hold of his DNA. And so they did a socially um, distant thing. Mm, interesting interesting there's a bit in there for us as i said before bit in there for us you know when they start locking us up for wearing masks we know so the pandemic is over (laughs) that's just that's just an aside i know they're locking you up for not wearing your mask but in terms of they start locking you up for wearing masks then you know that the pandemic is over. This is where we're saying goodbye for today.